Teaching Blast. Technical seminars are an Intertech production. For instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. Well, welcome back. And in this chapter, chapter three, we're going to learn a little bit more about storage, in particular, messaging with queues. As we've already talked about, there are three different types of cloud storage in Azure. Blobs, essentially a big file system for putting things like images and documents. Tables, a hierarchical data table. As I mentioned, kind of think of this as a big Excel spreadsheet. No relationship between tables, but allowing us to store entities in a structured format. And then lastly, we have queues, which is the subject of our chapter here, which allows us to do asynchronous messaging. In order to work with any of these storage mechanisms, we have to have a storage account. How do you develop a storage account? Well, again, you can do it either through the portal or a management API. In the last chapter, we had you build a service. We took a look at the build development of a web cloud test service, which had a web role in it. Now we want to set up a storage account. We do that, at least it's starting off, in a similar fashion. We'll go to the Windows Azure portal, and we'll ask to create a new service. I know, it's storage, it's not actually a new service, but as far as Azure sees it, storage accounts are actually just another type of application. So once we get to the page asking for a new service, we'll create a storage account. In this particular case, again, we have to provide a label, much like we had to for a hosted service. So we'll call this our test storage. And again, we can provide any kind of description that we'd like. And again, we have to provide a name a URL name for our storage account. This will be the URL that allows, that is the endpoint for our storage and allows our applications to gain access to any three types of storage. Again, blobs, tables, or queues. So in this case, we'll say, we're gonna call it welcome storage. And you'll notice again, the rest of the URL is provided by the actual Azure environment. We'll check for that availability of that URL. It looks like we're good. And once again, we have to pick a location for our storage. In this case, again, I'll ask to put it in the North Central US region. And with that, my storage has been created. And you'll notice Windows Azure, the portal provides me indication of the three endpoints, one for blobs, one for queues, and one for tables, along with access keys, both the primary and secondary. It's the access key that we'll have to use in our application in order to gain access to those three storage mechanisms. Let's go return now to our content and talk more about how to use that storage account. A couple of points to make about that storage account we just created. All storage, whether it be queues, tables, or blobs, is stored in triplicate in Azure. Interestingly, queues and tables are actually stored in the same fashion in Azure. One also important point to make is that data transfer between services and data storage located within the same region is not subject to data transfer charges. So one way to help bring down the cost of your application is to try and get your hosted services and your storage accounts located in the same region. If that's possible, you don't have to pay for those data transfer charges. Now, how do we start to use that storage account and be able to put queues and tables and blobs to work in our applications? Well, nicely, as part of the Azure SDK, a client library is provided, which is automatically made part of any kind of cloud project we create in Visual Studio, that allows us to access that storage with a very nice .NET API. The .NET API is actually built on top of a REST API. And in fact, all of the cloud storage is accessible by the REST API, not only by .NET applications, but any type of application that can speak REST. For those who develop .NET applications, this client, libra this client library, as we'll see, will make for some very convenient access to either queues, tables, or blobs. What do you need beyond the client library or the REST API to talk to the storage account? Well, if you're running in the actual cloud, you'll need, of course, your account name, your account key, 
and the actual endpoint where the actual uh, storage is located. If you're running, however, in dev fabric, in development mode, you will only need this little configuration setting, and that is you development storage equals true to indicate essentially that you're running in dev fabric and your storage is essentially being housed inside that dev fabric SQL Express or SQL Server environment. Now that configuration information is again made possible through the service configuration file. So inside of the service configuration file XML and service definition file XML, we'd find the establishment of a data connection string that when we're actually running in dev fabric, it's going to be set to use development storage equals true. When we're not running in dev fabric, when we're actually running in the cloud, the data connection string will again be set to use the account name, account key, and endpoint. Now what we really want to try and build when we're building Windows Azure applications is tightly integrated, loosely coupled systems. In other words, systems that work well together, work closely with each other, components that work closely with each other, but aren't bound together. Tightly coupled systems lead to pretty brittle code, whereas loosely coupled systems aid in scaling and performance. So how do we do that? Well, in particular, we're going to use message queues often to work that tight integration of loose coupling magic. We'll do that through messaging queues in our storage account. Roles or components in our applications are able to talk to each other via messages sent through the queue. And that is in comparison to, or in other words, versus direct communication with each other. We could have a component set up a communication with another component. But because of that communication, that direct communication, those two applications or those two application components might be more tightly coupled to each other, having to know more details about each other. Through so using a message queue, an application component can talk to another application component only through knowledge of messages, not with having to have knowledge of the other component. So exactly what is a queue? Well, queues are used essentially as stores for messages. They are first in, first out type of an operation, and they're one way. So an application could essentially put a message on a queue, while other applications are grabbing messages off of that queue. And again, we'll use those messages to communicate with one another. In Azure, each queue has a name, and queue names must be all lowercase and must be URL friendly. A queue can hold an unlimited number of messages, at least theoretically. There's obviously some physical limit out there, but it's one heck of a lot of messages, especially when you consider that each message is only 8K in size, or I should say limited to 8K in size. Messages have to be serializable, and in fact what we'll find is the content of a message is either in one of two forms, either in a simple string or by, by array format. And typically what we'll do when we establish communications between two components using this loosely coupled message queue to communicate, we'll use what's known as a work ticket pattern. What's the work ticket pattern all about? Well, essentially, messages that we create and use to communicate between components won't actually contain data that's needed for a component to get its work done, but a pointer to the real data, presumably in some other storage mechanism, either table storage or maybe something like SQL Azure that actually is used by the process to get its work done. So essentially, the message just serves as a little token about what work needs to be done, but not all the data that's necessary to get that work done. Now let's talk a little bit about some terminology with regard to this loosely coupled queue messaging system. Any kind of component that is placing a message into the queue is what we call a producer. Any type of component that's grabbing a message off the queue and using that message is what we call a consumer. And again, queues are first in, first out. So producers put the message on the bottom of the queues while consumers are pulling the messages off of the top of the queue. So let's look at the typical life cycle now of messages as they're used by things like web and worker roles with Windows Azure storage. So let's say we have a web role that receives requests from some outside user. That web role might create a message and put that message in a queue. Here shown via the REST API. The message now residing in the queue essentially deposits information about some sort of work that needs to be done by some back-end process, in our case, by worker roles. And of course, the web role responds back to the user, but it might receive many more requests and deposit many more messages for work to be done by back-end processes, worker roles. 
a worker role monitors the queue and requests to get a message off the top of the queue. When it gets a message, it'll specify a timeout, how long it anticipates using that message before that message should be removed. Here we have an example again of the XML message that might be inside of the queue. Once that worker role has a message and completes its work, it requests the queue to remove the message. Essentially what we call consuming of that message. And here again is the REST API to remove the message that the worker role has consumed. We might have a second worker role that's out there and also getting messages off of that queue. But what should happen if that worker role goes down or has some sort of difficulty? That second message was never physically removed from the queue. So in fact, after a certain timeout, that message becomes available again in the queue, where another worker role can now request and get that message and work with it and process it. If that other worker role should come back online and again try to get message to or even delete message to, it won't be allowed to, as the queue will recognize that it is timed out and now that message is being used by another worker role. So through this method, mechanism of getting messages and deleting messages, we have a fail-safe mechanism to make sure all messages are eventually consumed. For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led .NET, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.